Historical History of the United States, Episode 1.19, The Changing Nature of Plymouth. Before we begin for this week, I need to go back and correct a mistake that I made during our last episode. During the episode, I had made a comment that one of the descendants of Thomas Prince was Commodore Matthew Perry, better known as Commodore Perry. I also happened to mention that he would become famous during the 1800s for opening up trade with China. That, however, is incorrect. Commodore Perry did not open trade with China. He opened up trade with Japan. So I am sorry for that mistake. I just flubbed on the words right there. Last time, we discussed a shift in the Plymouth colony that occurred during the 1620s. The assault at West Augusta marks a turning point for the Plymouth colony in many ways. It marks a shift from the diplomacy that colored the first two years in the Pilgrim-Indian relationship. And it is also going to start a shift in the colony that will push it into a more militaristic direction. Today, we are going to spend time looking at these changes and how the colony is going to evolve in the wake of the events at Wessagusset. In the years following the attack, we will see the damage done to the local trade and relationship with the other tribes other than the Wampanoag. However, despite this strife, the colony is also going to begin to stabilize, and by the end of 1623, the fear of starving to death during the winter is going to be a thing of the past. It is that evolution in the colony that we are going to march through today. The middle and late 1620s are going to mark a specific era in history for New England. The colony is going to become increasingly stable and self-supporting. However, it is still going to be a while before the Great Migration that is going to hit like a tidal wave in the 1630s. If, after last time, you felt that Massasoit had played the colonists regarding Wessagusset, you're probably right. The threat against the colonies of both Wessagusset and Plymouth were reported directly from Massasoit. Massasoit was the single largest beneficiary of the attack. In fact, in so many ways, he's really the only one to benefit from the attack. The Pilgrims might feel good initially that they had dealt with the Indian threat, but the question still remains how much of a threat there really was, if any at all. The Massachusetts people had never actually launched an aggressive attack or in any way engaged the English. Sure, it's possible that Massasoit was passing on real information and that an attack was imminent. However, today there is no evidence to suggest that that's true. If there is any truth to this position, then that is something that has been lost to history. However, I want to avoid portraying the Pilgrims as being just hapless rubes in this situation where they were completely manipulated by Massasoit. The Pilgrims had entered into a complex political environment. It is true that at times they were thrust into incidents that were largely beyond their control. For example, we need to only look back at the situation regarding Squanto to see that there is a battle to control the Pilgrims. And while Massasoit clearly decided to tie his future to the Pilgrims, it is impossible to believe that he had forgotten the Pilgrims supporting his attempted ouster. Even after the death of Squanto, it takes months before there is a return to normalcy between the Wampanoag and the English. Meanwhile, the actions and behavior of the colonists in Wessagusset had certainly not endeared them to anybody. When Massasoit comes with his warning, it's not the most unbelievable thing that the Massachusetts would be wanting to attack. Furthermore, keep in mind that we know that Bradford and the Pilgrims were aware of the Powhatan Massacre in Jamestown. Bradford writes about it as a defense towards spending time and money building more fortifications around Plymouth. With this in mind, it could not have been far from his mind that maybe the Massachusetts actually were going to plan an attack against the English, like the one that had occurred months before in Jamestown. We don't know if Massasoit knew about the attack in Virginia, However, he would have been aware that the Pilgrims were obviously tense. The other side of the story, however, is something that we can largely see in the letter from Pastor John Robinson. We looked last time at his letter warning Bradford to tread carefully with Miles Standish. Standish was essentially nothing more than a hired mercenary. He wasn't one of the religious members of the Leiden congregation. To say that he came to New England looking for a fight is pretty true. That's what a mercenary is. Standish was hired to fight. He had built himself a small army, and it isn't surprising that he wanted to use it. For Bradford, it isn't that he is easily manipulated necessarily, but rather he finds himself in an unfamiliar land, and at this very moment in 1623, he is working with evidence that shows just how dangerous the natives could really be. 
Bradford didn't want to see his group get slaughtered like in Jamestown. We don't know how much he believed the rumored threats by Massasoit, but it doesn't really matter. At that moment, the pilgrims were open to doing something dramatic. Massasoit stepped nicely into that spot and provided them with the context necessary. Regardless of the underlying causes, as we stand in 1623, the pilgrims, for all intents and purposes, had tied themselves to Massasoit. Nobody else is really going to want to deal with them as a deep distrust is going to spread. Massasoit may have purged his immediate enemies, but likewise, he had also tied his future to the English. The popular narrative has always been one about how the peace reached in 1621 endured for decades. Well, not to take away from the diplomatic accomplishments of that treaty, the enduring peace was largely something born out of necessity for both groups. Both the Pilgrims and the Wampanoag had done so much to isolate themselves from everybody else in the wake of Wessagusset. For better or worse, the Pilgrims and the Wampanoag had established a new status quo. And while there is still going to be future consequences, those are for the future. Internally, the colony begins to move in a direction of stability. In the fall of 1623, William Bradford made a change to the colony that would have far-reaching implications. From the time they had first landed in Plymouth, food had been grown communally. Bradford, however, made a critical change during that fall and decided that instead every individual household should be responsible for their own food production. Bradford writes, And this, while no supply was heard of, neither knew they when they might expect any. So they began to think how they might raise as much corn as they could and to obtain a better crop than they had done, that they might still languish in misery. At length, after much debate of things, the governor, with the advice of the chiefs around him, gave way that they should set up every man for his particular, and that regarding trust to themselves, in all other things to go on in the general way as before, and so assigned to every family a parcel of land, according to the proportion of the number for that end, only for present use, but made no division for inheritance, and ranged all boys and youth under some family. This had very good success, for it made all hands very industrious. So as much more was planted than otherwise would have been by any means the governor or any could use, and saved him a great deal of trouble and gave far better content. The women now went willingly into the field and took their little ones with them to set the torn, which before would have alleged weakness and inability. Whom to have compelled would have been thought great tyranny and oppression. Bradford's decision here did a couple of things. The primary thing that it did is it gave all of the colonists, and by that I mean male colonists, a plot of land of their own. The individual colonists would receive a plot of land, which they would then be responsible for the upkeep of and growing food on. The food produced on the small plot would belong then to the individual colonist. This is going to do a couple of critical things. First, with food production now being done by the individual instead of by the community, there is going to be more incentive to work the crops. With communal growth, it means that everybody is eating equally, even if there is not an equal distribution of labor. Based on what Bradford writes, the implication is that the women and children of the colony didn't work in the fields. So this means that an unmarried male colonist working for 10 hours a day in the field was going to get the same ration as a family of four would get, despite the man in that family putting in only 10 hours of work. With the breakup of the communal food system, there was now all the incentive in the world for the entire family to pitch in when it came to growing crops. After all, if you didn't tend to your own personal crops, you were going to starve to death. Based on Bradford, suddenly both women and children were seen in the fields tending to the crops. This makes growing food move from the man's job to a responsibility that was held by the entire family. Of course, there's going to be another side of this to consider as well. With the end of the ration system, the pilgrims were going to be undeniably happier. They had more food and they no longer had to stick to strict rations that literally nobody liked. Likewise, with the family owning the surplus of food, it was going to take like 10 seconds before somebody figured out that they could sell or trade that surplus. Suddenly, food went from being a communal good to being a commodity. Bradford poignantly writes that, For the young men that were most able and fit for labor, and service did repine, that they should spend their time and strength to work for other men's wives and children without any compensation. 
the strong, or men of parts, had more in division of victuals and clothes than that was weak and not able to do a quarter the other could. This was thought injustice. The aged and graver man, to be ranked and equalized in labors and victims, clothes, etc., with the meaner and younger sort, though it had some indignant and disrespect unto them. The real benefit of this system, however, is that it marks the functional end of starvation in Plymouth. Following this change, there are no longer reports of starvation or hunger in the colony. In fact, Bradford writes about the abundance that now exists within Plymouth. Sure, there are still going to be struggles to strive ahead, however, the pilgrims aren't going to starve to death, and hey, well, that's something. With growth in Plymouth and a move away from communalism came a new problem for the colony. In response, Bradford introduced the idea of trial by jury. In much the same way that was common in England at the time, and remains the model today, those accused of a crime would be tried by 12 honest men. This is going to become an increasingly important point after the resupply ship arrived in 1624. It was becoming a problem in the colony that the strangers were not all that wild about the extreme religious practice of the Leideners. While everybody still was in basic agreement that the colony needed to work together to survive, there was no denying that the Leideners were a bit more hardcore about things than the strangers were. Likewise, there is a good deal of proof that William Bradford was not an easy man to live under. Take what Bradford wrote about the resupply ship and when it arrived in 1623. They brought about 60 persons for the general, some of them being very useful persons, and became good members to the body. And some were the wives and children of such, as were here already. And some were so bad as they were fain to be at charge to send them home again the next year. In other words, Bradford had afforded himself a degree of power that when he decided that he didn't like a handful of the settlers from the Ann, for whatever reason, he went ahead and just sent them back home. Now, the general reason for the dislike appears to be that they weren't working hard enough to please Bradford. However, this is an important fact. Bradford had become something of a gatekeeper for Plymouth. He had the power at this point to allow people to remain in the colony, or, if he didn't like them or approve of them, send them back to England. The situation would play out again in the spring of 1624 with two passengers that had arrived aboard another supply ship called the Charity. Bradford took considerable issue with a specific passenger named John Lyford. Almost immediately upon arriving in the colony, Lyford allied himself with John Oldham. Oldham had arrived in the colony aboard the Anne, and since the time that he arrived was basically at odds with absolutely everybody and everything about the colony. Lyford, for his part, was a relatively unknown minister. Lyford would quickly become a popular figure in the colony. As a minister, Lyford presented a potential option for those in the colony who did not share the deep beliefs of the Leideners. This obviously made him popular for the strangers, and more importantly, Lyford was a huge rock in Bradford's shoe. For Bradford, Lyford presented a threat to their way of life. The last thing in the world that the Leideners wanted was the people in Plymouth to worship in a fashion that in any way resembled what they had left behind. Now, if Bradford didn't like Lyford, please rest assured, the feelings were completely mutual. Lyford didn't much care for Bradford either. Bradford would become even more enraged when he learned that Lyford was not just risking the immortal souls in Plymouth, but he was actually writing letters back to England that life under the pilgrims was basically miserable. And to be fair, nothing that Lyford was writing appears to be untrue. Lyford described a colony that was intolerant to outsiders. Bradford, who had been tipped off to these letters, took it upon himself to retrieve the letters, make copies, and accuse Lyford and his buddy Oldham with the conspiracy to destroy the government. Both men were convicted and banished from the colony. Oldham was quite literally chased out of Plymouth as the pilgrims beat him with the butt ends of their muskets on his trip out of town. And just a quick note here regarding John Oldham, we are going to see him make one more appearance this season. He is going to return in a couple weeks just to die. It wasn't like the merchant adventurers back in London didn't know about the harsh conditions in Plymouth. More than once, they had sent letters telling the pilgrims to stop being such jerks. In fact, during this period, nearly a quarter of the population of Plymouth would end up either calling it off and going back to England or heading south to the much more tolerant Virginia. Not surprisingly, those leaving were not members of the Leiden congregation, 
it was the strangers that are getting chased out of town. And despite the fact that Bradford will write in defense of himself, keep in mind that there is probably a good argument to be made that Bradford was doing exactly what he intended to do. The Leideners left Holland because they were trying to get away from the outside influence coming in and corrupting them. Somebody coming into the colony like Lyford was always going to be viewed as a direct threat to that vision. These feelings were made worse in 1625 when the Pilgrims learned that John Robinson, their longtime leader, had died. Following Robinson's death, there was palpable fear in the colony that their way of life was going to be challenged. Despite the fact that they had lived 3,000 miles away from Robinson for the last five years, his passing was a devastating blow to the collective psyche of the Pilgrims. As beloved as Robinson was, it is at least interesting to know that Bradford basically ignored his warnings in regards to Miles Standish. Robinson had cautioned Bradford about the actions of Standish, and for the most part, it seems that Bradford just kind of shrugged off and declined to accept the advice. Standish would continue to remain in an important position in the colony and would act as Bradford's sword for years to come. By the time that 1625 had rolled around, Plymouth had gained a reputation as being a highly disciplined, borderline militaristic society. An interesting tale of this comes from Bradford writing about settler Thomas Morden. Morden founded a small colony known as Marymount. This colony, located near modern Boston, was basically the antithesis of what the Pilgrims wanted in Plymouth. The town literally had a giant maypole in the middle of it. Bradford writes about the stories of drinking and just general happiness in the colony. Making matters worse for the Pilgrims, Morden rejected their religious ideology and actually tended in the direction of paganism. I've seen a few references to this town in my reading, yet I can't seem to find anything that clearly states whether Morden actually was buying into his own colony or was, you know, just doing this to annoy the Pilgrims back at Plymouth. If the plan was to upset the Pilgrims, well, then it worked very, very nicely. More seriously, Morden was becoming popular with the Indians and really didn't have any qualms trading them muskets. William Bradford surely could not let such happiness reign free for long. Dispatching Miles Standish, the colony of Marymount was made far less merry. Morden was captured and brought back to Plymouth, where he was put in the stocks. The maypole was cut down, and the fun of Marymount came to a quick close. This is yet another example of the fact that by this point, basically nobody likes the Pilgrims. They were seen as overly disciplined, and by this time, they were in the mid-1620s and had earned themselves a reputation for being overly aggressive. Miles Standish was not an endearing personality to basically anyone around him, save for William Bradford, apparently. At this point, Plymouth had reached an interesting position. Everybody basically hates them. Aside from the Lighteners, of course, everybody who interacts with the Pilgrims finds them to be overbearing, intolerant, and honestly a bit on the cruel side. And I've given you a handful of the interactions of the European outsiders. However, be aware that these are only some of the reports. There are others, and honestly, they are all just about the same. Everybody despises the colonists, and they aren't shy to tell those back in London about it. In return, the investors turn around and yell at Bradford to play nice, and yeah, then again, it's going to be rinse, lather, repeat. However, for all the complaints about them, the Pilgrims were actually doing okay for themselves. As we stand in 1625 now, the Pilgrims are basically just where they want to be. The complaints from the outsiders weren't exactly the thing that bothered the pilgrims. The colony was actually doing pretty well internally. Food shortages were a thing of the past, and sure, the whole West Augusta thing had been some pretty bad optics for them, but it did buy them the safety and security that they had wanted. By all rights, the other tribes in the area were more than happy to keep their distance from Plymouth. And while this is bad for trade, it did help secure the general safety of the colony. While those inside of Plymouth may have viewed the colony as working nicely, the investors back in England had a different idea. We have already discussed Thomas Weston and how he would never ever quit the Pilgrims, promptly quitting the Pilgrims just a couple months later. However, if you recall, by that point several of the other investors had already decided to jump ship. While the colony is on a more steady footing internally, it wasn't exactly becoming more profitable. Much like we see in Jamestown, there just really isn't that much profitability in the North American colonies, at least not yet. The Pilgrims had actually become pretty good at the fur trade, however the cost of creating the colony in the first place still significantly outstripped the profit of the colony. 
by 1626, the Merchant Adventurers had decided that they had enough of losing money. The Merchant Adventurers disbanded and basically left the Pilgrims high and dry. Several of the early settlers in Plymouth, including Bradford, Winslow, Brewster, Standish, amongst a few others, decided that they would go ahead and absorb the debts of the colony. The agreement was that this group of seven settlers would take on the debts, but would be given in exchange a state monopoly over the fur trade. At this time, it must have seemed like a fantastic idea. Even going back to the conversations between Weston and Cushman before the trip, it was clear that the Pilgrims were never really in love with the idea of working for the merchant adventurers. Now, however, under this agreement, the colony was going to be theirs and theirs alone. There does, however, remain an obvious problem to the situation. The merchant adventurers are not giving up control of Plymouth because it is so profitable and they don't know what to do with the money. Rather, they're bailing out of the colony because it's nothing but a money pit. Plymouth was far from turning a profit, and a change in ownership was not going to do much to remedy that situation. Initially, the Pilgrims did well in the fur trade, even setting up a series of outposts. The problem, however, is that the colony is now so deeply in debt, and before long, they are going to cease being the main port of New England when Boston comes online. The Pilgrims are going to remain in debt, so that even with a strong fur trade, it did little to pay down the principle of the loans, and only went towards the ever-mounting interest. It's going to take nearly 20 years for the Pilgrims to actually pay off the debt, and by the time that they did, it had come at a great personal cost. Despite their best efforts, Plymouth is never going to become a profitable colony. Likewise, new competition was slowly starting to move in. Now, next time, we are going to begin addressing the Great Migration. However, beyond that influx, the Dutch were also setting up their colony. We had talked a few episodes back about the fact that the Dutch had their eyes on what would become Manhattan. And in 1624, they decided to pull the trigger and buy the island. With the purchase came a new colony, the New Netherlands. And in the years to come, yet another new competitor was going to be in the region. And while the New Netherlands is not going to immediately compete with Plymouth, it is just one amongst dozens of colonies that is going to begin popping up in the region over the next several years. The cumulative effect of these colonies is absolutely going to cause a point of competition with Plymouth. If it feels like I've been working with an anti-Plymouth bias this week, I assure you I'm not. This is a 400-year-old fight now and not one that I have a dog in. However, I wanted to address the question because we are about to see the biggest changes yet coming to New England. Over the course of the next several episodes, we are going to begin looking at the journey through what has been dubbed the Great Migration. This mass exodus is going to see some 80,000 people leave England in the better part of a decade. Of those masses leaving England, about 20,000 of them are going to end up in New England. It is in Plymouth, however, that they will settle in. Almost overnight, we are going to see Boston, a city that doesn't even exist in our narrative yet, explode onto the scene and become the focal point of the region. And that's not something that it's going to give up anytime soon. Sorry for the spoiler, but Boston is going to remain the focal point of a ton of our story for the next 150 years or so. Plymouth will continue to see slow and steady growth. However, the maximum population estimates I see for it never really exceed 3,000 at any given time. It is going to remain a relatively small colony, and of those 20,000 coming over to New England in the Great Migration, very few are going to find their way into the colony. Now, I think there is an argument to be made that the Pilgrims in Plymouth were probably plenty happy with that situation. In fact, we are going to see more of the Lighting Congregation continue to slide into Plymouth. The evidence doesn't really bear out that those settlers in Plymouth, specifically the Lighteners, had much interest in becoming anything more than a semi-closed community. Let's not forget why they left Leiden in the first place. They were concerned about the corrupting influence of the locals in Leiden and throughout Holland. The hope was that they would come to the New World and somehow be able to separate themselves from all the corruption that they saw in Europe. In so many ways, I think a lot of the Leiteners would have been just as happy to be rid of all the strangers, travel to the New World, and then wall themselves off. And of course, this is never going to be possible, and they probably were all aware of it. If this sounds like I am painting the end of our time in Plymouth, well, that is partially true. This isn't quite like the line in the sand that I had used while talking about Jamestown, where I quit talking about it just because that story had reached an arbitrary line that I had decided on. In fact, it's not as though Plymouth is going to be leaving our story even. 
we are going to continue to return to Plymouth throughout the remainder of this season and throughout the first half of our second season before it eventually merges into the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1691. The difference is that this is going to be the last time we have an episode that is completely focused on Plymouth. Because starting next week, we are going to begin talking about the Great Migration, and as I mentioned a moment ago, Plymouth is quickly going to move away from being the epicenter of life in New England. So, more than anything, it is that Plymouth is on the verge of being eclipsed in our story by new colonies that are going to begin sprouting up in and around New England. Next time, we are going to dive into the Great Migration. We are going to take a look at a slew of new colonies forming throughout New England, colonies that are going to become major centers in the events that follow. We will spend most of our time back in England looking at the causes of the Great Migration. After all, if there is some reason that some 80,000 people are bailing out on England in a decade, there's probably a reason that they all are so anxious to get out of Dodge. Until then, however, I hope you all have a great two weeks, and I will see you back here then to begin our journey into the Great Migration and the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Thank you.